Brian Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. Support the Black College Sports Network so we can continue to provide you coverage. Go to myjbn.com slash support and be a part of the Black College Sports Network. Tell everybody they can follow their dreams. Brian Fulford, A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BC. YT Productions. <laughs> I love my HBCU And boy, boy I love it, love it yeah. I love it, love it yeah. I love my HBCU And man yeah. I hope my team they won one yeah. I hope my team they won one yeah. man. I hope my team they won one yeah. I hope my team they won one yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab To see if my team won a loss If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth But if they won, she tab uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yeah. And you gon' learn today, you gon' learn today How your team they play, play, they play yeah. How they play, boy, you gon' learn today How your team they play, they play, they play How they play, play, yeah We represent that swag, that me and let me say, say What's up the Tennessee, stay, stay You tune into the agency, sports lab This is Dr. Gaville with Inside HBC Sports Lab Welcome to episode 115. I know many of you all have one eye over there on True TV with Texas Southern University out of the SWAC. And they have a 55 to 121, I mean 55 to 50 with 121 left in the second half. For those that are not watching the game, shout out to Chuck Hunt, Will Bo, James Bryant, Kate Johnson in the house. And we'll keep you updated in regards to the final. So if you have it on, it's fine. Turn the volume down. Turn us up. Make sure you focus this way and keep that one eye over there. We got you. We're going to get it going on. With that, welcome to episode 115 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab Show and Podcast, the show that's covering the sporting HBCU diets for all things HBC sports, from institutions large and small, from NAIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs, in the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Kavil, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is on assignment celebrating his wife's birthday, so we know that you need to do that right. But we have a good one in his stead, pledging today on Inside HBCU Sports like we like to do. We'll give him a little haze and y'all bring him in right. None other than Mo Carter. 
WZDX Sports uh, broadcaster extraordinaire. So we're going to get a little touch of the real thing today in terms of how he'll bring it. And you see in the background, he has the jersey out there. Yes, he is a Southern alumni as well as on the gridiron. He got it done under Pete Richland. He brings a championship to the table with him as well. So we got a lot of expertise in here today. Again, just to give you another update, 55 to 50, one minute left in that showdown uh, in regards to what's going on in the first four, as they call it. With that, let me say welcome, Mo Carter. How is it going today? Dr. Gaville, everything is going great. Good to see you as always. Glad to finally be on the show with guys like you and Charles. Of course, you know, I'm a big fan as well. Always tuning in when I get a chance. So whenever you gave me the call earlier today and said, hey, can we bring you on? You know for sure that the answer was going to be yes. And I almost feel you know, a return favor because for all the people that don't know or don't remember, Dr. Cavill, you were a guest on our 30-minute football preview show when we were previewing the Alabama A&M football team a few weeks ago, and we had a, definitely a great conversation with that. And who knows if your prediction that you made at the end of our preview show holds tight. I may need to bring you back to get a prediction for the SWAC championship football game as well. For those Alabama a and and Prairie View a and fans out there, it's one that you might want to cross your finger. Our other colleague over there is like not so fast, Mr. Charles Bishop. We call him the professor. He's on it for us today. How are you doing today, Charles? I'm doing well, Dr. Cavill. Doing well. Another uh, great, beautiful Thursday here in Houston. Uh, got a chance, get a chance to watch some uh, exciting HBCU uh, football action this weekend, baseball going on. So much going on in the swag. Looking forward to the weekend. Certainly, 56 to 51 with Justin Hopkins making a free throw. 34 seconds left in that contest. It is an interesting. Hold on, Tigers. Where is Chatterbox when you need him? I know, right? Uh, say it. Grab on to your radio. Let's That's bring it home, Tigers, <laughs> for the Texas Southern Tigers, as well as the SWAC. They're the last team to get it done. This is, would be an interesting one. The anniversary of that big upset, talking to you, Mo Carter. You know what we're talking about there. Southern over Georgian Tech. Uh, the coach, uh, um, in coach terms ben of Co Coach Ben Joe getting it done against his uh, predecessor, if you would, taking down Bobby Crimmins in that matchup 57 51. Um, as the second free throw was made, 34 seconds left. With that being said, as we follow and get you in there, before we get in the news of the day, I did want to give a quick ups update. When we got the Stillman Tigers, they were playing in the Sweet 16, as they call it, the Final 16 in the NAIA over there. I know the NCAA uh, puts everything on lock in terms of the terminology you can use with that. So something to consider there. They lost a tough one. Two free throws at the end of the game. They were up by five, six points with four or five minutes left and could not hold on. So they are out of the tournament. Great run by the Stillman Tigers, the HBCU out of the NIA, the last one standing at the NIA Division II level. Credit to them uh, just in terms of that. Uh, we'll give you some more update before we get in that as we get into some more of this. Um, last update I have for you now is 57 to 52, 28 seconds left, May through May free throw by the Mount, as they like to call them in those pounds. Uh, those parts, Damien getting it done there. Charles, what are uh, some news of the day before I give you that? Today's episode of Inside the HBC Sports Lab is sponsored by THG Agency, LLC. THG Agency is a company that provides sporting, educational consulting, and data analytics. With that, Charles, what is some news of the day? Sure thing. Well, huge news today. Black College Football Hall of Fame, they announced the HBCU Legacy Bowl, the Black College uh, Football Hall of Fame today. They announced uh, that a postseason all-star game will showcase the best NFL draft-eligible football players from HBCUs. So this is a quote from Doug Williams. The HBCU Legacy Bowl means opportunity and exposure for HBCU players and coaches. We're excited to have this in New Orleans, especially during Black History Month. The game will take place on the Saturday after the Super Bowl, February 20. 22 at Yieldman Stadium at Tulane University and will be broadcast live on the NFL Network. No doubt about it, man. That's some big time news. And that came out of nowhere. They said they had a surprise yesterday on the Twitter land. We didn't know it was going down like that. 
we'll have to get you some more information going there. Mo, what are your thoughts on that? I love this whole entire idea of the Legacy Bowl. Now, I can say this. A few years ago, when I went with Alabama A&M um, uh, to the Pro Football Hall of Fame for the Black College Football Hall of Fame Classic, when they took on Morehouse, Dave Baker did talk about more exciting events that will involve both pro football and HBCUs, especially since there's so much of a connection between the two. You look at all the amount of Hall of Famers that have come from historically black colleges and universities. And he basically said that that kickoff classic was basically like kind of just the beginning. Now we're seeing the HBCU Legacy Bowl roll into it. NFL Network's already saying they're going to do multiple streams of coverage. They're going to, of course, you know, broadcast the game. And then when I read the press release too, the thing I really did enjoy about reading that was saying, basically in a nutshell, they're saying that this is going to be a week's worth of stuff for the legacy bowl which means that you're going to see the 40 times run you're going to see the practices i can basically say you know what you see when you see the hb i mean excuse, when you see the senior bowl coverage on um on nfl network i would expect them to kind of do something similar to that nature maybe seeing you know of course the 40 yard dashes and the practices however they decide to split up the teams talk with some of the top prospects talk to also representative from all 32 national football league teams and maybe even a few cfl teams as well i love the exposure that the nfl network is definitely putting together so just just think just don't think that it's just going to be a game it's going to be an entire weeks full of experience and i got a good feeling that there's going to be a lot of eyeballs not only from the pro circuit but of course across the hbcu circuit checking out the top prospects for next year's draft oh great point great point great information great insight that's why we bring mo carter on he does it we have him in our messenger uh where he gives us a lot of insight so i want to give you credit here live in front of everybody. We say thanks. We want to give you credit. A lot of the information you get from us, we're able to navigate that space. And when Mo is able to get it out, um, he brings it to us and uh, gives us the opportunity to do it. With that, it is just gone final. The mm. Tigers defeat the Mount 60 to 52. Big time swag win uh, in regards to that. They get that credit for a win in the tournament as they move on to uh, the seating of the Next round in terms of that 16-1 matchup. Texas Southern goes to 16 and 8 on the season, and the Mount falls to 12 and 10. NEC, they are now 0 and 32, I believe, in terms of the NCAA tournament. Um, got it done. And that was a big halftime adjustment by the coach in that game. He sped the tempo up, said they were playing too mo too close. Um, they said it on the news before they came, but I was getting a chance to uh text Kevin Granger that was live at the game and he said hey we got to speed it up we're playing too slow they were down by 10 with that big bucket literally with seconds on the clock by the point guard they climbed back really quick and took a one-point lead as they scored 11 straight and they pushed the tempo the rest of the second half and really took it to them went a little bit back and forth but they uh got it near the end of the game and pulled it out as they took a lead and would not give it back up credit uh, to Coach Jones. He gets it done. He gets the NCAA tournament win on his belt for Texas Southern Tigers. This is the second Final Four win, uh, first four win by the SWAC, both of them by Texas Southern Tigers. Uh, man, when they get in the tournament, um, after that first tough loss, they have figured out that Final Four. I know Charles is smiling in a lot of ways. He gets that extra additional money, and he'll put it into good use. But with oh, yeah. that, let's go a little further into that. And let's, let me do this. I apologize. Let me let you all say if there's some things that you want to say. Let me go to you, Mo, and then I'm going to come to you, Charles, to see if there's anything that you want to say about this matchup in regards to what just went down by the Tigers. Well, the first thing I'll say is that, of course, that's why you call it March Madness. In March for college basketball teams, you always need to find a way to play your best basketball. And I mm. think that you guys can definitely agree with me on this one. Texas Southern was playing some of their best basketball down the stretch in the latter part of February. And then in uh, the month of March, they rolled through the uh, SWAG championship game. Basically kind of had entire control of that Prairie View game. I know, you know, you can say what it was and what stuff, but like out from where I watched it, it looked like Texas Southern basically like came in there and say, look, we're going to take them down. You got to also think too, Coach Johnny Jones, he's a savvy veteran. This guy has been 
um, in the NCAA tournament as a player back in his days at LSU and also, you know, as a coach through the years at various places. And, of course, you know, when you have a veteran squad like he has, he knew for sure that he had a lot of good things going on. So basically, in a nutshell, with them rolling with the momentum, it kind of basically said that once you made those adjustments, especially at halftime today, you had a feeling that Texas Southern might be able to, like, you know, pull something out. Not taking away anything from Mount St. Mary's and really getting a chance to see them, like, talking about this year. But we do have insight on Texas Southern and seeing what they've been able to do. And, of course, they've got the momentum or whatever from the SWAG championship into this first four game. Now, of course, it's going to be a big one, you know, in their next contest when they take on a number one seed. But you got to be happy for the Tigers representing not only the city of Houston, but also representing the Southwestern Athletic Conference. And, look, I know what you can say about first four this and first four that. In the record books, it is a win in the NCAA tournament. And like you mentioned, Dr. Cavill, there is more cash flow coming to the conference as well. And Dr. Charles McClellan will always enjoy that. And don't forget, he's sitting probably um, – he's sitting somewhere watching these games water with him being on a committee and stuff for the NCAA right. tournament too. Mm-hmm. I'm not exactly sure if he's in New he, York because the travel – uh, but- No, they're in Indiana. They are and, in the – okay. Uh, he actually said that his games that he starts to watch, he's assigned to is actually tomorrow. So he, quote, unquote, got a free day. So he is in the arena for that game with his son uh, being a part of the Texas Southern Tiger team. With that, let me go to Charles and give me your thoughts uh, in terms of what you thought about this game. Well, I think you touched on it. It was a, a tremendous coaching adjustment by Coach Johnny Jones uh, to speed the game up and allow Texas Southern's athleticism uh, to really – uh, help uh, get them, you know, propel them in this game. This is another game uh, where, uh, and I've said this about Texas Southern, they have so many scores, it's who's going to step up on a particular day. Uh, today it was John Walker, 19 points and nine rebounds. But we've seen all throughout the season, uh, they've had various uh, high scores throughout the course of the year, whether it's Galen Alexander, Michael Weathers, uh, uh, Nichols. Uh, they all seemingly uh, picked their game up uh, whenever, whenever somebody else is down today, Michael Weathers uh, didn't have the best games. He was only three of eleven from the floor. From the floor, but again, you had John Walker pick his game up, nineteen points. So I can't say enough about uh, how versatile uh, this offense is from Texas Southern. They really uh, can hit you from a lot of angles, and we saw that in the Swag Tournament. Michael Weathers got hot. Uh, we saw Justin Hopkins get hot, and uh, they put it all together at the right time. Yeah, great point. I want to give a shout out to EC Nobles bringing it. Texas Southern has won 10 consecutive games, 15 of the last 16. Great point. As you just said, Charles, they were playing some really good basketball, man. And to their credit, they get to move on. They represent the swag well. So let's move on to some other news of the day. Staying with Texas Southern University, 69 issue relay scheduled to take place Saturday. March the 20th, that's this weekend. So um, it'll be fascinating. A lot of people will be out there celebrating uh, as they're watching the Tigers as they prepare for some more basketball from the Texas Southern men's program. With that, let me go back and stick with you, Charles. Some other news that you want to share that's out there? Yeah, there was a great article by Stephen Gaither today <clears throat> in regards to uh, Norfolk State quarterbacks, uh, Juwan Pudi Carter. Uh, he might be looking at uh, entering the transfer portal. Uh, he is the straw that stirs a drink for the Norfolk State offense. Uh, so uh, it's it's a very interesting read when you take a look at uh, he's an all MEAC performer. Uh, <clears throat> he has he's going to have Norfolk State, I think, in the mix in the MEAC this upcoming season. But you know he he is using you know his uh, I, I don't want to say leverage, but uh, he is. Uh, very concerned about who they're going to bring in to be the new head coach uh, since La- Latrell Scott has resigned. So uh, it should be very interesting to see what right now. Yeah. who they bring in. Yeah, great point. Uh, he is uh, very concerned about who they're going to bring in to be the new head coach since Latrell Scott has resigned. So it should be very interesting to see what Norfolk State brings in to be the new head coach since Latrell Scott has resigned. So it should be very interesting to see what Norfolk State brings in to be the new head coach since Latrell Scott has resigned. So it should be very interesting to see what Norfolk State brings in to be the new head coach since Latrell Scott has resigned. So it should be very interesting to see what Norfolk State brings in to be the new head coach since Latrell Scott has resigned. So it should be very interesting to see what Norfolk State brings in to be the new head well, of course, um, you know, big news that you guys were talking about on Tuesday was the postponement of the Alabama A&M Prairie View game that was set for this upcoming Saturday out there on the other hill, the one that's not here in the state of Alabama. Uh, but, of course, COVID-19. The other hill. Good job. Represent. You got to hunt. That's what you do. That's what you do. 
uh, hey, you know, I mean, I'll go through my newscast and be like, hey, the hill or whatever. But until, you know, I get outside of the North Alabama realm and stuff, you know, you have to kind of, spe- you know, specify certain things. Same way they do when, you know, LSU talks about Death Valley and Clemson talks about Death Valley and which one's the real one and stuff. You know, we ain't going to go all into that because we could probably talk about that for an entire three, four hours. But, um, yeah, of course, you know, we that, we know that game was uh, postponed due to COVID um, positive tests within Purview's um, football program. And we were kind of figuring out what the heck was going to happen or whatever and stuff. But um, got some word yesterday. Actually, I spoke to the Sports Information Department at A&M, and they said that that game was going to be rescheduled for um, April the 3rd. And then the SWAC put out their official announcement today, including that game. And, of course, the Jackson State game against Prairie View will now um, be moved on back to April 24th, if I'm not mistaken. So That's correct. Yeah, so that's really, really good to know that those games will be rescheduled. I know a lot of people are looking forward to seeing, you know, those upcoming matchups, especially with Prairie View, with Alabama A&M, and also with Jack State. Because, I mean, you got to think between those three teams, the way things are going, you got one team that's kind of a favorite. You got other, another team in Jackson State that's picking up momentum. And then Prairie View, that's picking up a lot of momentum as well, especially with, you know, wins over two big rivals in back-to-back weeks. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Like Charles had said earlier in the week in the text message to me, I was definitely looking forward to that game because I wanted to know whose defense was going to show up in that yeah. one. Prairie View's offense has been high-powered, and, of course, we know what a quill, gla- a quill glass can do at Alabama a and Coach Maynard against Coach Dooley. I mean, those are probably two of the best offensive minds probably in uh, probably FCS football in general. So mm-hmm. we just got to wait just a little longer. Mm-hmm. I did talk to Coach Maynard yesterday via text, and I asked him how he was feeling. He said, of course, their first three games have basically been impacted by either COVID cancellations or also um, postponements. And, of course, he said it's tough to keep his guys motivated and stuff, but they're finding ways to do it and whatnot. Unfortunately, just have to deal with another bye this week before they host Grambling on next week. Great point when you said that Alabama A&M at Prairie View has been rescheduled for April 3rd, as you said, at 2 o'clock currently. Prairie View A&M at Jackson State has been rescheduled for April 24th at 1 p.m. Obviously, a lot of football to be played, but those could be end up being some big games now that they shift to the end of the season. They would have recalibrated if they were played over the next two weeks. We would have got a little more understanding and maybe some clarity in terms of the race, but now they may be – Uh, for who's up in the division in a lot of ways. So it's going to be fascinating to see what goes on. As we've seen, they actually talk about these games will be on the ESPN platform, uh, and they're slated to be carried on those platforms. So it'll be interesting to kind of keep up with that. Before we take our deep dive into um, football for the second half of the show and some of those matchups, as we are moving through, I did want to give an update and get your thoughts on this Norfolk State, Appalachian State, um, in terms of this other first four between two 16 seeds. Norfolk comes in 16-7, winning the MEAC, as you know. Uh, they were, they had a co-share of the Northern Division of the MEAC, and they played Appalachian State out of the uh, Sun Belt Conference. And so it'll be interesting to see what goes on there. I'm going to go to you, Charles, first on this one. What are you looking to, uh, and your thoughts in terms of this? What are you looking in terms of this matchup? And do you believe that Norfolk State can get the second HBCU Division One tournament win of the day? I do, uh, and I do believe uh, Norfolk State does the very MEAC things that they uh, that we look at with MEAC basketball is they rebound and play good defense. Uh, I, I thought uh, Norfolk State, uh, for lack of better words, was was fortunate uh, in that NCAA. Uh, North Carolina A&T was not in the MEAC tournament, but uh, credit to them. They handled the business and they, they won the tournament, uh, but they do both of those two things very well. Uh, they rebound and they play defense. So I think those are the things, even if you're not as explosive on offense, you can always rely on <laughs> rebounding the basketball and keeping some possessions. Yeah, I'm going to go to you, Mo, and ask your breakdown on this, but let me show that I do have my Texas Southern uh, gear on the day representing a little bit. I had my Norfolk State cap when I went down to the tournament a couple of years ago um, and went into uh, the Walmart to pick up some um, stuff, essentials, to make sure I could get through the evening. They had the Norfolk State cap then. I was like, I can't go this far and not get my hands on the cap, right? Thanks. So I had the cap, put it up there, and induce 
moved around my caps and know I couldn't put my hand on it right before the show. So I'm a little upset that I couldn't really show out uh, in terms of this weekend and just show how much I'm really into all this HBC. But enough of that about that. I want to see what Mo thoughts are in terms of this matchup. Anything that stands out in terms of what we should look at in regarding the Spartans? And well, saying look, at I'm the look. end of that, with Charles, do you think they can pull it out? Oh, well, Doctor, I'm looking at um, Norfolk State's schedule, and of course there are a few cancellations and whatnot in it, but when you look at it, I mean, they basically have won one, two, three, four, five, six. They've won eight games in a row, dating back all the way to the early part of February. So how we talked about riding that uh, wave of momentum in February into March, I mean, they're definitely doing that, and of course, you know, they went through the likes of, you know, Central and Morgan State in the process, but as I look at Appalachian State, they struggled down the stretch in the regular season they just happen to get hot during the um yeah. during the um the sunbelt tournament in which they mm -hmm. were able to knock off little rock and texas state coastal carolina and georgia state in route to you know getting that championship but i did look at these stats for appalachian state they are a very very balanced team when it comes to scoring mm -hmm. their top five scorers all average at least 10 points a game. Their top score is about 13.2. Next guy is 13. The next guy is 12.9. Then the following guy is 10.7. And then they have one other guy that's at nine. And then the sixth top scorer is at eight points a game. So, I mean, that's a pretty good balance when you really look at it from a scoring perspective, which shows you that any type of night, any one of these guys can like really, really make some things happen as far as taking over a game. So sometimes when you have that balance, that's kind of hard to defend because as you, if you're a coach, you can't be like, oh, we're going to double this guy tonight. We're going to double this guy tonight. Make sure we get a whatever on, on him because all of a sudden, hey, we're so balanced and we know how to get the ball out to this person or that person. All of a sudden, it kind of becomes a nightmare scenario or whatever from that. So honestly, I just really think that, you know, Appalachia State may have a slight edge going into this because, you know, their win, like basically their last loss was more recent. So they know how it is or whatever compared to Norfolk State's last loss being almost like about a month ago. And of course, Appalachia State really had the idea of going through the Sun Belt Conference tournament more like pinning their ears back, knowing that, look, it's win or go home or whatever. or We have to like win and survive. Of course, when you get to the big tournament, everything is win or go home. So it just kind of really depends on how, you know, how much momentum are the were they carrying from, um, you know, from their tournament into the big tournament. So it'll actually be quite the, quite the match, to be honest with you or whatever, from that one. And usually the Sun Belt team usually gets like a 13, 14 seed. So I'm actually surprised that they actually got like a 16 seed in this one. But well, of course, like I said, they were a low, low seed going into the conference. I guess that kind of plays a part into it. Too. Right into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great points there in terms of between that matchup. Series not dead. We're right on top of the half an hour. We're going to take a break uh, as we get into it. But before we do that, I did want to ask, you know, some short commentary, if you would, uh, in terms of the women's tournament with um, North Carolina State taking on North Carolina a and NC State, if you would, number one seed in that uh, region uh, in terms of the Aggies. And then, the two versus 15, which features Baylor and Jackson State. Sticking with you, Charles, um, which of those two matchups, how are you looking in terms of what some key things? I know those are very challenging matchups, but as we just talked about Norfolk State, they're the last, one of the last teams that we can remember out of the MEAC that had to be <coughs> upset uh, as a 15 over a two, um, not too many moons ago, if you would. But Charles, talk about those two matchups, if you would. Well, with Baylor and Jackson State, the thing that concerns me most uh, with, with Jackson State in that game is uh, taking care of the basketball. Uh, they had a whole lot of turnovers in that SWAC tournament, uh, especially the Alabama State game. So I think there were over 20 or so turnovers, but uh, they got to protect the basketball. They've got to get decent possessions. And, um, you know, it's, it's a simple sort of <laughs> thing to say, but uh, you got to uh, knock down a few shots. You got to stay in the game early and, you know, just give yourself a puncher chance in the, in the second half. Baylor is an extremely 
strong basketball team. And, and just like we say in the swag, Jackson State is able to throw a lot of size at you. Well, now you got the David Goliath thing going where now these teams get to throw a lot of size at you, especially uh, NC State and, and, and A&T. So, uh, you know, protect the basketball and, and give yourself an opportunity in the second half. Yeah, good points when you look at that. I'm going to go to Mo, and I want to get your thoughts as well in terms of uh, anything we should look at particularly. I know these are, especially on the women's side, uh, it's more challenging in total of 16 versus 1, 15 versus 2. Anything that we may hold on to in regards to what we could possibly see uh, of, of what could lead to an upset in between these two games, either one of these games? Well, I think for Jackson State, one thing that definitely has like played a great role for them this year is the fact that the competition in the Southwestern Athletic Conference women's basketball was actually you – know, the competition was high this year or whatever. I mean, you know, Jackson State had to like really, really dig out some certain games or whatever against Alabama A&M and against Alabama State. We saw how that SWAC championship game came down to the wire. So from the competitive standpoint, they're definitely there. Now, of course, they're going up against Kim Mulkey and those Baylor Bears. I mean, we've seen Baylor be to the mountaintop. One thing I will say is that, of course, Baylor's been at the mountaintop, but of course, you can always see that scenario where, you know, you may overlook someone. So, of course, Jackson State's going to have to come out and play not only their best basketball, they have to play their best basketball and play mistakes state free and of course they've got the bodies to like get the second chance shots but like they're literally going to have to do it to almost perfection to pull any sort of upset from there now as far as the other matchup I mean North Carolina State that literally is man it's it's really really hard to like gauge and see anybody knocking them off or whatever in a nutshell I mean they've had some top whatever wins this upcoming year but I think it just really just goes back to it from the women's side things are hard to gauge so that's why you literally just have to play your best basketball and hope as a 16 seed that the one seed is kind of like looking over you when when it really you know rolls back to it I remember when I was in school I remember Southern won it and they had to go play UConn UConn had never trailed any game that year and all of a sudden they <laughs> Yeah, I, re- I I never forget Southern went up like eight to four on them, and Gina Oriana called a timeout. Now after that, they went on like a thirty to nothing run. But you know, it shows you that sometimes certain people can be overlooking certain teams. Of course, Maya Moore had one heck of a game that year, one of the best players in the game or whatever. But I mean, that kind of goes to show you sometimes those one seeds may kind of overlook the sixteen just for a little bit. So you have to steal that momentum when you can. Great point there. In terms of that A4, I can remember that. Boy, I was like, ooh, look at this. That was a big – I mean, in terms of what UConn was doing at the time, that was a huge statement to even think that you can get that. Obviously, it didn't last as long as we would like. But with that, let's go to a break. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Mike is out on assignment. So we have Mo Carter, WZDX Sports, sitting in the chair, going through a little hazing scenario. We're going to make him a little uncomfortable as we get into some of this football mix when we get right back. But before we do that, stick with us. We're going we're gonna to take a break, and we'll see you on the other side. Follow the Black College Sports Network on social media at MyBCSN1, the number one, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at MyBCSN1. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. It's like a loop machine. All around town, trying to get down. This is Dr. Cavills with Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Sitting in for Mike Washington as he is out on assignment is none other than the great Mo Carter, WZDX Sports. Bringing it to you like he always does with a little hint. We wanted to bring him on here so he could talk about the Alabama A&M Bulldogs and Prairie View. But as you heard early in the first half, 
that game has been postponed. But don't worry, as we told you, it has been rescheduled. With that, before we get into some of these key matchups, and I want y'all to go in because you all are the experts and know how to bring it and break these games on. This is what our Thursday show is about. People really want to get into the games and hear what are our thoughts before the games are played because they start the itching at the end of the week and they're ready to go out there. Not as usual when they could just go all in and get the tailgate, but, hey, it is spring football, and people have waited a long time for a piece of this puzzle, nice. and we've had the ups and downs like we have in a lot of seasons, so a lot of folks are surprised and excited about what's going on. So with that, let me get you into these poll rankings and see what you think about my poll ranking uh, as we're into the mix just dropping out of the polls this week, as we said in, in the last show, the Delaware State Hornets, they lost the game to South Carolina State. South Carolina State rebounded. I thought that was a good indication for Alabama a and moving forward from the standpoint that uh, people were still questioning how much of that was the South Carolina, how much of the Alabama, Alabama A&M. But we shall see. Bringing us to number five. None other than the South Carolina State Bulldogs, one and one on the season. They were not ranked 72 points. So they jump and debut in terms of the top five in week number three. Number four is Arkansas at Pine Bluff, 1-0. They hadn't played in, uh, in over a week. As their last game was the previous week when they defeated Southern. Surprised a lot of people there, 73 points, but they remain at number four. Bringing us to Prairie View, sitting at 2-0, um, two big conference wins. Both of them over their rivals. First week of Texas Southern. Last week was Grambling. Defensive struggle as they get it done. We know Prairie View for offense, but that defense is showing around and making a little statement. Should be interesting to see can they continue to get it done. Two first place votes. Um, they remain at number three. They do add a first place vote this week. And number two, you have Alabama AM and the Bulldogs. One and oh, four first place votes, 109 points. They were previous ranked number one last week, but not playing hurt them as Jackson State continues to roll. Uh, they get a second conference win, three wins overall, six first-place votes. Moving up from the two spot is 111 points. I'm going to go straight to Mo since he's our guest today. Let me know what are your thoughts on Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab Spring 2021 edition of the 2020 season, football top five instead of top ten. Well, Dr. Gravel, taking a look at your top five, I can totally agree with all of these um, rankings and whatnot. Um, it would have been real interesting to see how oh, number two. I got to stop you right there, Mo Carter. I got to give you credit. Charles, <laughs> you, the guest on the show today. Did you hear Mo Carter? He said he he, he likes my poll. I think we might need to bring this brother back a couple of more times, Charles. I, I'd like I know. You. I mean, if you start fucking up. <laughs> I'm just saying. Go ahead, Mo. I'm sorry to disturb you there, but I just, that brought music to my ears. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, no, I actually like your top five. I mean, taking a look at everything, of course, I would have loved to see number two versus number three this upcoming weekend. That would have definitely, you know, showed where Alabama A&M stood and also where Prairie View A&M stood, you know, coming off of the, the scenarios that both of them have kind of like gone through. Of course, Arkansas Pine Bluff, they had the big win at Southern, um, you know, a few weeks ago. Well, and recently, let me say it like that. And South Carolina State, of course, they got back into the fold and whatnot. Of course, we've seen what Jackson State has been able to do against, um, you know, against the teams they played, you know, in the first couple of weeks from Edward Waters to Grambling um, to, why am I losing who they just played? Uh, Mississippi Valley. I'm so sorry. That's, that. Yeah. That, that's not your fault. Oh, <laughs> Valley. Everybody forgets about Valley. You, you, it's not you. It's Valley. That's not right. That's not I said it. But go ahead. No, man, that's not right, because actually, believe it or not, there's actually like a, a good contingent of Mississippi Valley alums who actually work here in the city of Huntsville. I go to church with quite oh, a few of them, as a matter Tell of fact. Tell them to tune in the show. I'll make sure I give them some love. All right, yeah, I'll definitely uh, share, share that um, 
info with them moving forward. But I mean, yeah, you know, Jackson, we've basically seen Jackson the most. So in a nutshell, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't put them at one and stuff. I mean, you know, for the Homer and me being here in Huntsville, yeah, I would love to see AM rise to number one like they were in the box two roll polls. But of course, we have to go by the eyeball test right now. And because of that, and also because of postponements and COVID and things of that nature, we literally have to just wait and see. One thing I can say, Doc, is that, look, man, this is still early stuff. We still got the meat of the schedule that still needs to be, you know, played out coming up. And, of course, with the matchups happening this upcoming weekend, a lot of this definitely could change. And, you know, um, the narratives could change as well. So we'll see how everything plays out, especially with that Jackson State versus Alabama State game that will be played on Saturday in um, the civil rights capital of the world, Montgomery. Alabama, you show sure enough, and we'll get a little bit into that mix. But I like what you said also, and I try to tell Charles that. Don't worry about the week. The week is early, man. The games get to play up. Jackson, Alabama, a and will play. Prairie View and Alabama, a and are going to play. Going, thought we were going to play this week, but not to be. But they'll play a little later. These things will play themselves out. With that, let me go to Charles and see how much he wants to cut me in terms of top five poll rank. No, I, I, I'm, I'm in total agreement. I, I think. Um, oh, um, see, now Jackson we, State is number one. Is number yeah, one. you know, I, I kind of like that. <laughs> but I, I, I think uh, the season is still in front of us. I think this is an uh, important data point this weekend with Jackson State and Alabama State. Uh, Jackson State will be playing a team that actually has a game under their belt. So we'll see how that kind of plays out in that, um, you know, Alabama State has some, some film uh, to look at uh, and, and things of that nature uh, with Jackson State and, and vice versa. So uh, it'll be a very interesting thing, Jackson State going on the road, uh, taking on this Alabama State team that, uh, I, you know, I thought Southern jumped on them pretty quick. And then once they settled down, they looked a lot better. Uh, Ryan Nettles, I thought, settled into the game. Uh, he, he threw a couple touchdown passes, 16 of 27, 149 yards. But I really like their running game. I love Ezra Gray. Ezra Gray is a hard-running running back. Uh, and you team him with Ja'Cory Merritt. They, they were a nice one-two punch uh, going against Southern. So I, I think Jackson State will have their hands full this weekend going against Alabama State. Uh, I think that's going to be a great game. Mo, like you mentioned, uh, I was really looking forward to uh, Alabama AM and Prairie View. And uh, whoever Alabama AM's left tackle was uh, or is uh, going up against Story Jackson. You know, Story Jackson uh, hunting down a, a quill uh, a glass uh, in that game, but we have to wait on that. So uh, really looking forward to that matchup with uh, the, the amount of defensive starters Prairie View has. Uh, I think they're going to be somewhere in the mix toward the end. And interesting game this weekend with UAPB and Grambling. You know, I I don't know how Grambling can get off the mat if, if, if they go 0-3. And this is a, a UAPB team that comes in with a lot of confidence. Uh, to go to Baton Rouge and get a win, that's huge. It's one of the toughest venues uh, to play in the entire swag. And to go to Baton Rouge and get that win, uh, I can't say enough about UAPB and Skylar Perry and and the way they really took it to Southern in that game. Man, our A&T fans in the house, they are already talking about football as well. They're ready to get FAMU or JSU on the schedule in the Circle City Classic or in <laughs> somewhere. I'm like, those two teams' schedules are already full, Aggies. Yeah, so they'd have to wait till like 2022 at least. Right, yeah, exactly. Not going to happen, uh, man. That's what but happened. you know what, Dr. Cavill, 2022 for North Carolina a t may not be a bad time to add those teams. Because remember, they're going to the Big South. Big South's losing a pair of teams in UNA and also uh, Kennesaw State. So they're going to have additional openings or whatever that would have been considered conference teams, you know, that basically I, won't be there anymore. I agree with that, and I think that was a great point. I think the challenge that North Carolina a t is going to have with playing – SWAC schools is now you're going to 12 teams, eight conference games. That means in 11 game season, you got three um, non conference games. You're usually going to have one that's a home game. Uh, oftentimes, that's going to be a Division II opponent, <clears throat> right? Correct. Or maybe a regional matchup if you're trying to get into that in terms of what that looks like. One's going to be an FBS program. And then you have a lot of the teams starting to play uh, those home game classes. So the problem you have with A&T is they'll have the room on their schedule side, but 
what about the teams in the SWAC? They're not going to have a lot of room on their schedule. And then that's not even talking about depending on the rotation. Correct. Are they going to want to use one of those games to play a team that's quote unquote a non swat game to hold on to a robber that's gone away because of the divisional matchup? And I think made money from that's it. That's about the ability of A and T to play versus what is going to happen with SWAC when you have some of those teams. So it's going to be fascinating to see can it work out uh, just because what's going on with SWAC. But the last thing you said there uh, in terms of that is the Pine bluff Bramlin matchup, Charles. I want to mm-hmm. take a little deeper dive in that. Like I said, I have uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff number 14 ranked. Bramlin is coming in off 0-2, making a change to the offensive coordinator. So they're struggling a bit. Can't put up points. Mm-hmm. Defensively, they've been pretty solid uh, in terms of what is going on. Some people may question that a little bit about how they look against Jackson State. But they're having some issues. Is it the quarterback position? Is it the offensive line? Is it the wide receivers, and the inability to run? Or is it a little bit of all those things? Let me go to you, Mo, to give me your thoughts in terms of that matchup. And I'm going to come back to Charles to give me more in terms of what he's seen on there. Yeah, with Grambling, I mean, despite all the mistakes they made in basically their first two games, they both were in situations to almost win the, the game against, well, they were in a situation to win the game against Jackson State until you turn it over at the one-yard line. And then the turnovers that played that were plaguing them against Prairie View in the State Fair Classic this past weekend or whatever, they still had a chance to like go ahead and do that too. Um, uh, Dr. Cavill just kind of piggybacking on what you say. The defense for Grambling is making enough plays. They're just not getting enough offensive production, mm-hmm. I feel. And Great of course, point. that kind of led to, you know, the changing of the guard with the OC. And of course, the quarterback, God has been there for a couple of years. You would have thought like this was his moment to step up and be like, okay, I got to carry the team on the back. You didn't really, really see that like talking about um, when I was listening to the game. Shout out to Santori Black for hooking us up with the play-by-play on the radio since we know the whole TV situation with State Fair Classic that we will not get into. But if you know, you know. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, you know, it, it just seemed like he was about to like take it over and he just never really rose to the occasion. And I think the defense really, really kind of got tired a- in the end. But I mean, you look at the turnover back. I mean, they picked Prairie View off multiple times, got a bunch of fumbles. Unfortunately, just things didn't go for it. Now that defense has got to go against probably one of the perhaps surprise offenses with some of the mm-hmm. best talent in UAPB. And, I mean, I got a chance to see that PB team last year when they played Alabama A&M. And, I mean, they came out quick strike against the Bulldogs. And all of a sudden, Maynard's team was playing from behind. And they just didn't have enough firepower to make a comeback against UAPB. And I think they're carrying, carrying that over this upcoming year. I mean, the Ballard kid, he's going to be playing on Sundays. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Barry Ballard he's going to be playing on. He has great size, great speed, and then I mean, he's got like that getaway speed too. So Grandma's going to literally have uh, their work cut out from this week. And I think Coach Fob is probably preaching the whole look, guys, this is our season, really, because if they go zero and three. It's going to be tough to come here to Huntsville next week and play Alabama A and M, who's going to be trying to you know put all the frustration as far as not playing as many games into you know putting a good game in front of a home crowd. So, yeah, I really, really think the pressure's more on Grambling this week to get the victory over, over UAPUB than what it is for the Golden Lions. Yeah. Mo, I know that you have to cover these games, so I won't ask you for a prediction unless you want to give one. But I want to ask you for a prediction. I'll let you um, continue to do the work that you have to do. But that doesn't mean I can't ask Charles for one. Prediction, uh, Charles. What's your thoughts? I like Grambling at home. I, I like Grambling to uh, come off the deck uh, to get the win. Mo touched on it. Uh, they've been a play away in two games that they that they've had losses. They have too much firepower. The question becomes, which Jeremy Hickbottom are you going to get? Uh, the Jeremy Hickbottom that played against Jackson State, he caught them up. To be honest, which uh, you know he he found he found receivers uh, running in between the zone and things of that nature. They were right there uh, in place to, to to get the win against Jackson State. Kudos to Jackson State for a uh, born and neck at the goal line. Uh, same thing, uh, you know, you take a look at the Prairie game and to have that much firepower and to not uh, get it done. I've been relatively surprised at Grambling not being able to run the football. Uh, they have guys like uh, C.J. Russell, Killen Elder, um, great one-two punch. And then you throw in Lindemian Brooks in, in that as well. 
And these are guys who can flatten get it done. We've seen them get it done get it done during swag play. So to not have that running game up and going has been a little bit surprising. Um, I, again, the question becomes Higbottom or Elijah Walker, or is it somebody else? So, you know, I, I think Jeremy Higbottom, um, Mo, you touched on it. He has to kind of up his game, if you will. If I'm not mistaken, uh, he's 11-9 and nine now as a starter, and Jay Walker touched on it. You know, that's that's just not a record that's going to cut it at Grambling. So uh, he really has to step up. Great point there. When you talk about that, let's slide to this next matchup. And I'm going to save the Jackson for last since this is the number one ranked team in my poll this week. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to Southern at Texas Southern. We just talked about Grambling wanting to get off the slide. Mm. And as you like to talk about uh, getting them off the ledge, and it sounds like you have walked them back to the ledge. You got Troy Lamont that I told you just asking about the Aggies, but you got Willie Axe Hines saying if Grambling lose on Saturday, Fire coach files will get even louder. Oh, of course, talk about Southern, and depending on what they get down there, they could get a little ugly in the whole state of Louisiana between Grambling and Southern if things don't quite go right this weekend. I already talked about the screen, no big deal, but it sounds like in the state of Louisiana, it's getting real big real fast. With that, let's look at this Southern matchup going into Texas Southern. Texas Southern looked really solid uh, coming in that first week at uh, Prairie View. A lot of people are saying, well, that was that prayer view not being the same prayer view in terms of being a team that can push at the top, uh, or is it the change in terms of the quarterback? We saw a change because of an injury. It looked like they, Texas Southern has found the quarterback really solid, certainly playing good defensively. Give me some more in terms of your thought on this matchup, Southern going into Houston for Texas Southern University at BBVA. This is a scary game, I think, for Southern. Um, Thaddeus Payton, I think, is, is a quarterback who really looked good for Texas Southern. Uh, Texas Southern has to find a way, I think, to not shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, we, we've seen now that they can score. Uh, Ladarius Owens, tremendous running back. Uh, he had 119 yards, I believe, in, in, the, in the Prairie View game. Defense was flying around all over the place, but it's the mental mistakes. It's the mental mistakes that I think catch up to them, an untimely turnover, a false start here, things of that nature. So, you know, the question becomes, can Texas Southern fight the Southern ghost, you know, uh, pl uh, the, uh, playing the, the aura of Southern, if you will? Uh, we almost saw that happen with UAPB. You know, they jumped out on Southern, but Southern gets a black punt and boom, boom, boom. Now you look and you're fighting for your life. Can Texas Southern overcome those things to get this win against Southern? Taking a look at Southern, which Ladarius skeleton do I get? You know, that, that's the question. Oh, man, I, I love the way you break, broke that down. I agree with you 100%. And as you said about playing Southern in the mystique, as I like to call it, playing that brand, it can be a challenge for teams that hadn't been up consistently, even as they are ascending and playing well. you got to find a way to close out. I think in a lot of ways, going back a little bit, Pine Bluff at Grambling, it's that same type of game uh, yeah. in regard as what Pine Bluff did at Southern, playing the mystique and the brand. Got an update uh, as we got the legendary Ken Rashad over Sweat Page Network, right? <clears throat> or the old Sweat Page Network, TSPN, uh, <laughs> as we talk about that, swag.com, Sweat Page, as he gets it done. He just gave us breaking news. He believes Hickbottom will likely not start in the game against UAPB mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what's going there. And that's the HBCUsports.com, I should say, uh, in terms of what that looks like. But Ken Rashard, thanks for uh, the acknowledgement, giving us that news to make sure that we get the story straight here. With that, going back to you, Mo, what are your thoughts in terms of this Southern Texas Southern matchup? As far as the Southern Texas Southern matchup, I mean, Charles really kind of Kind of hit it on the spot. Which Ladarius Skelton are we going to see? Another thing, too, is that I've, you know, I've read a couple articles on my alma mater, and I have um, seen that Coach Otis that says that it was still going to be an open competition. And uh, don't be surprised if you see two quarterbacks uh, playing against Texas Southern on uh, Saturday, which I really think that, you know, he's kind of playing maybe not mind tricks, but more just keeping an opposing coaching staff on their toes. One thing I noticed, though, against uh, with Southern when they play UAPB, I felt like they got away from the rushing attack very, mm -hmm. very early. 
And because they did that, that really kind of just threw off a lot of things along with Skelton getting, um, you know, taken out of the game for the personal foul penalty and whatnot. But of course, yeah, that the loss, uh, I've, I've heard it all for like two weeks now, the loss against UAPB, that was embarrassing um, on, you know, on your national television circuit for Southern Jaguars who were expecting a win on that. And of course, the defense actually did play well. It was just the offense turned it over too many times. Crazy thing is they still had a chance to actually win that game. You take away those three turnovers, you get one score out of that. Southern probably gets that victory, but it just goes to show you that how important turnovers are in a game for a team that's already building on momentum with that. As far as Texas Southern, I really think it's more about just getting off the snide. I mean, I know the guys didn't win a game last year, and then, of course, they've lost, you know, close game or whatever this year. But, like, if you look at some of their losses, they have been some very, very, very close losses. Charles, you hit on it, man. I mean, they're shooting themselves in the foot too many times. If they find a way to play mistake-free football or limit their mistakes – then, you know, they might have the Jaguars number on that. Then you talk about the fire Dawson, I mean, excuse, you fire the Broderick Five things. You may hear the fire Dawson Odom things as well, which me personally, I don't like to hear. But at the same time, of course, I'm just one person or whatever as part of the Alumni Association. I don't have that um, type of power to do it, but you're going to hear it. And there's going to be some pressure out there. And who knows? I mean, you're talking about you could have an 0-3 Grambling and 0-2 Southern starting it. I don't remember the last time either one of those teams were in that scenario. It's been Ooh, quite great. a while. Great nugget. Great nugget. You know, we go back As to – to come up to the top of the uh, close of the hour, I want to make sure we get this Jackson State, Alabama State in here, number one ranked Jenks, Jackson. And you can finish that comment as you then move into the Jackson State, Alabama State thought process. So, Charles, go ahead and start there uh, mm -hmm. as we got about – four or five minutes left. Sure. Well, I, I mean, we, we, we wondered if these spring games were going to mean something. And if the if the fans are howling already, you know, yeah, the, the scoreboard being on, it means something. So, um, you know, the spring football has, has been a, a real hit. And I think a lot of fans have really uh, enjoyed what we've seen thus far. Tough matchup, I think, for Jackson State this weekend with Alabama State. You take a look at the last 10 contests. Alabama State has won seven out of the last 10 uh, from Jackson State. Jackson State did get a victory the last time they were in Montgomery. But I, I think uh, Coach Prime, uh, Deion Sanders, has Jackson State playing at such a level right now. Uh, they, you, the moniker, I believe, they he really has them believing. Uh, they're flying around all over the place. They're making plays. This is such a different Jackson State offense than what we've seen probably over the past five, six years. They actually move the ball up and down the field, and they score. Big, deep threats in Dalen Baldwin and Corey Reed on the outside. They're going to challenge Alabama State, I think, vertically. Uh, but more than anything, Jack State has been committed to running the football. I think that has been a huge difference. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, a third and seven or a third and six. They, they have committed themselves to running the football, and when they get, those, get the uh, – uh, get the box stack, they take the shots downfield. So it's it's simplistic, but it works. No doubt about it. Great point. When you talk about Coach Prime taking the number one Jackson State Tigers program into Montgomery to face the Alabama State Hornets, classic Eastern Division matchup. Mo Carter, what are your thoughts? I'm going to piggyback off of what Charles said. I really, really think that um, both teams, Alabama State and Jackson State, are trying to commit to the run. So because of that, I would not be surprised if the passing games are the difference in this contest. I mean, for Alabama State, Michael Jefferson, you got to see where this guy is at. I mean, this is a tall, linky kid who can fly yeah. and get behind the defense. If Jackson State doesn't find a way either to go man on man with that guy with maybe a safety close to him, he could be a problem for them. Because I hate to say it like this, Jackson State probably won't be able to move the ball as much running wise against Alabama State's defense. And uh, um, Alabama State probably won't be able to move the ball that much against um, Jackson State's defense as well because of those um, earth movers, as they were talking about in the previous game. They've got some big boys between those two in the trenches. So that's why I think the passing game will be the big difference in that one. And if you can get one or two over the top, that may end up being the difference in this contest down in Montgomery on Saturday. And Jalen Jones comes in this game a little nicked up from the game against Valley. So uh, we'll see uh, about the health of Jalen Jones in this game. So uh, that could be a big determinant. Which means that you probably won't have that many QB runs then. Yeah, exactly. I think that takes away an, an element of uh, his uh, dynamic play in terms of uh, he is a legit 4-4 uh, quarterback. 
Man, great conversation, great dialogue. I know the viewers love it, but it's time for us to go. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of HBC Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment, so we have none other than Mo Carter, WZDX Sports, bringing us uh, the updates in his side of the story. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Lill's Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. We look forward to you next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Look for us on Sunday as we give you that special edition. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L, D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Course. Lecture. Charles, Lecture. Dismiss. Support the Black College Sports Network so we can continue to provide you coverage. Go to myjbn.com slash support and be a part of the Black College Sports Network. Tell everybody they can follow their dreams. I have in me the ability to support the Black College YT Productions. Yeah. I love my HBCU. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a lot. Yeah. If they lost, yeah. I'm quiet as a mouth. Yeah. But if they won, keep tab. Yeah. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with the hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, sir. and pay attention, yes. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. And you gon' learn today, you gon' learn today How your team they play, play, they play yeah. How they play, boy, you gon' learn today How your team they play, they play, they play How they play, play, yeah We represent that swag, that me and let me say, say What's up the Tennessee State, stay, stay. Tune into the agency, you're supposed to have